I always go back to what is the evolution of data to help you to help all of us out. So as Jonathan said yesterday, I was one of those kids that got an Apple IIe computer in the 80s, and it came in like four or five boxes. But I talk about the distant past about 1990 to 2000. So I was in high school and college during this period of time, okay? So there, the personal computer actually started to uh, be important. I remember saving up to go to college $3,500 so I could have a desktop. Okay? The, the laptops were that thick, and you had to change the battery every couple of minutes. But that's where data started to be accumulating, because now we had machines that could actually store data. You had better than floppy disks or whatnot. Cash registers started to store data. You didn't need a full room to actually store it in mainframes. And then and by the end of the 2000s, you had Apple, who came out with the next version of the alien head, you know, computer that had like pink and orange and green. We started evolving and started people buying laptops here. Now we had data. Now in the beginning of 2000, you started to see the evolution of big data, okay? Most people didn't understand what that was, but what big data is, is the ever-expanding ability or amount of data. We just saw that in what happens in 60 seconds. So how do we utilize that? Well, at first, we actually had to put the infrastructure in place so we can actually pipe it to where we could actually utilize it. And that's what happened between about 2000 and 2009. And about 2009, we had the infrastructure, and then we had the amount of data to be able to actually analyze it. Okay, slice and dice and understand what we had here, and we can make better informed decisions. At the end, 2013, 2015, data sciences became sexy. Okay, so machine learning. One of my biggest pet peeves about artificial intelligence is people say AI and ML. Well, ML is just one tool. It's been around since the 50s. But the reason we couldn't utilize it is we didn't have the amount of data to pipe through it, and we didn't have the pipes to get it to there. Now we do. We have a number of different ways and a number of types of learning to do this. So now we're moving towards 15 to 16, and we're starting to be able to put all those tools together, and then the machines can start learning for themselves and making decisions. RPA, assisted, genetic and evolutionary programming, and putting them together. And then the data evolution is moving forward, and that will allow us to build machines that can make decisions for us if we have the right risk and the right evolutionary profiles put together. I would like to now introduce you to Annie. Annie is, is, is my baby. She's artificial neural intelligence. And she is the equivalent, so we have 200,000 people that work for Capgemini, Jean-Claude. So imagine, Jean-Claude, that you have 400,000 eyeballs that can look at all of Capgemini's data for all of our clients, 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days. Kind of sounds like the Borg on Star Trek. I will use lots of Star Trek analogies today. So what she does is that she brings in structured data, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, and also unstructured data. And she uses a technology called DIVE, Data Ingestion uh, Integration Vortex Engine. And so we harmonize the data, and through a number of different data science tools that we build, inclusive of machine learning, uh, natural language processing, evolutionary and genetic programming, we have the ability to analyze all of this data all the time. And then she makes those decisions based on risk, and she shoots it out to all the other verticals. Okay, And we'll talk about the communication with the human a little bit. But she can identify what's at risk. She can identify what is root cause. She can make decisions, and she understands what we don't know.